I uh, introduce our second speaker on this panel, panel, Dr. Kazuyoshi Hotta from Otani University, who unfortunately I haven't yet met, so uh, I'm delighted to see you. Have you got everything you need? I am Kazuyoshi Hotta from Otani University, Kyoto. Uh, it's my great pleasure for me uh, to read uh, my research paper on this conference. <coughs> the title of my presentation is uh, On Corresponding Sanskrit Words of, Hosa, uh, of Prakrit Hosa, with special reference to Shravakachara texts and Buddhist texts. <coughs> uh, I would like to use several slides uh, during my presentation, uh, showing the main points of this presentation. <coughs> Section one, <coughs> introduction. <coughs> In Brahmanism, the Ubhavasata purification light has been practiced on the day prior to the performance of a Vedic ritual. <clears throat> we can find descriptions of this purification light in Brahmanical texts. For example, Shatapata Brahmana states as follows. <clears throat> uh, this is the English translation of Julius Egring. Uh, for assuredly, he argued, the gods see through the mind of man. They know that when he enters on this bowl, he means to sacrifice to them the next morning. Therefore, all the gods betake themselves to his house and abide by him or the fires of us in his house. Hence, this day is called Upabasata. This right has been incorporated by Jainism and Buddhism in different ways, where it is known as posaha or posata, etc., in Prakrit and Pali. <clears throat> On this point, uh, Dr. Hayan Fu discussed uh, before my presentation, <clears throat> and Buddhism has developed the light mainly as a ritual for mendicants. Many descriptions of the light can be found in Buddhist texts. Furthermore, the, this light has been practiced until today throughout uh, Buddhist Asia. On the other hand, Jainism has employed the light mainly in the form as a practice for the laity. Therefore, descriptions of Jaina Posaha are found in the group of texts called the Shravaka Achara, which contains cause of conduct for the laity. In this presentation, we will survey the corresponding Sanskrit words for Prakrit Posaha and their etymological meaning as seen in the Shravakachara texts. The volume that has to be mentioned as the most sophisticated work in this field is the study by Robert Williams' Jaina Yoga. <coughs> However, it has been over 50 years since its publication, and 
it is time to re-evaluate some of its findings. Firstly, we will examine his two assessments in section two. One is that there have come into existence a number of false Sanskritizations such as Paushada, Proshada, Poshada for the Prakrit Posa. The second one is that the word form Poshada seems to have attained the most general currency. Secondly, in section three, uh, we will examine the influence of differences between sects and authors on the use of the above three word forms. Previous research has not yet addressed this point. <coughs> Finally, in section four, we will survey the etymological interpretation about the respective word forms seen in Shurabhakachara texts, comparing it with the etymological interpretation seen in Buddhist texts. Section two, a survey of William's assessment concerning the word posaha, one. In this section, we will examine William's assessment that there have come into existence a number of false Sanskritizations, paushada, poshada, proshada, and poshada uh, for the Prakrit posa. The fact that the Prakrit posa corresponds to the Sanskrit word upabhasata can be confirmed linguistically. The ball u at the beginning of the word upabhasata drops because it does not have an accent. Furthermore, by changing aba into o and the consonant tu between two boards into fu, it became the word form posa. After the Agama period, Jaina monks who had more opportunities to write texts in Sanskrit needed to identify Sanskrit word forms corresponding to the Prakrit posa. However, they completely lost sight of the verb prefix upa and three word forms were assumed, namely paushada, proshada, poshada, as Williams argued. In the following, we will outline the meaning and usage of each word by also referring to the texts not used by Williams. <coughs> On Paushada, the word form Paushada is found in the text as follows. In Umas Bhati's commentary on Tattvata Sutra, it is used in the compound Paushadopabhasa. And the meaning of the word Paushada is interpreted as synonymous with the word Parban. That means the date corresponding to the four phases of the moon. Therefore, this compound is interpreted as Paushadesh Upabhasa, 
サッタミータスプルシャンハリバドラーズコメンタリーエンシッタセナガニーズコメンタリー which sub コメンタリーズとマスバーティーズコメンタリーオンタットバルタスートラ also interpret the word in the same way in プラシャマラティプラカラナ the word パウシャダ is used with the gerund of root cree Therefore, it cannot be interpreted simply as a synonym for the word parvan. In, the cases, in these cases, it is reasonable to interpret the meaning of the word paushada as a kind of vow or practice. <coughs> On the other hand, Shravaka Prajnapti Vritti. Interprets the word posaha in the compounds ahara posaha and sarira sakkara posaha found in Shravaka Prajnapti as synonyms for the word parban. Just like sub commentaries of Umas Bhati's commentary on Tatvata Sutra Devi. But this interpretation is also not. Appropriate. In such a case, it seems to mean abandonment or something in this vein. <coughs> Next is on Proshada, on the word from Proshada. <coughs> the following texts use the word from. Proshada. <clears throat> As in the case of Paushada, many of these texts also state that the word Proshada is a synonym for the word Parban. Similarly, the compound Proshado Pabasa is also frequently used. As another example, we can find compounds like Proshada Dina, Proshada Brata, Proshada Vidi. It is possible to interpret these compounds as synonymous with the word Parvam and also as a kind of vow or practice. Furthermore, Although only in a single case, there is also a text which interprets the word proshada as sakrit bhukti, which means eating on, only once a day. <coughs> And next is on the word form poshada. バーサガダサオビバラナハリバドラズサブコメンタリーオンタットバルタスートラダルマビンドダルマビンドブリッジシュラッダディナクリティアブリッジヨガシャストラエンドヨガシャスタブリッジユーズディスワードフォーム These texts generally interpret the word poshada like other word forms As a synonym for the word parvam. Further, the compound posha dopa basa is frequently used. In addition, compounds such as posha da brata, ku biapara isheda posha da, brahmacharya posha da, posha da shara, posha da pratyakiana can be seen. In the case of these compounds, Poshada cannot be simply interpreted as a synonym for the word Parban. The word form Poshada is also seen in Buddhist texts. We will discuss this point briefly later. The above is an outline of three word forms. 
As Williams stated, it is mainly these three, these three forms <laughs> that are found in many of the editions currently in circulation. Therefore, in regard to the first point, his assessment is mostly correct. But we can add that the word form Uposhada is seen in the printed edition of Bratudiotana Shrabakachar as the only exception. However, this example is limited to the stanza 107 and in other parts of this text, the word form Proshada is used. In addition, this is a very rare form because it keeps the verb prefix upa, which was lost in all three other word forms. <coughs> Taking the above points into consideration, we need to base our judgment carefully on whether the word form can be traced back to the manuscript and whether similar examples can be found also in other texts. Section three, a survey of William's assessment of the word Posaha two. In this section, we will examine William's evaluation two, that is the word form Poshada seems to have attained the most general currency. I referred to 52 kinds of Shraba Kachara texts for this presentation. <coughs> These texts can be classified as follows according to the Sanskrit word form corresponding to the Prakrit posa. As you can see from the table above, in the text which I have referenced, the word form Proshada is most common. There is the possibility of bias due to the nature of the texts that were consulted. So we should refrain from saying that the form Proshada has attained the most general currency. In any case, we cannot say unqualifiedly that the word form Poshada is most popular as Williams does. <coughs> Next, we will survey the influence of several factors such as difference between sects and authors on the dif difference between these word forms. This is an issue not addressed by Williams. <coughs> First, <coughs> please consult the table above from the perspective of sect from this point on, we will exclude the Prakrit Posaha and the exceptional form Uposhada. We can clearly see the following facts. <coughs> All texts using the word Proshada belong to the Digambara sects. On the other hand, all texts 
using the word forms Paushada and Poshada belong to the Shubeta and Bara sect. <coughs> and uh, please see note nine, uh, quote 2001, uh, whose field work is mainly focused on the Shubeta and Bara sect, regards the original word of this, of that bowl as Poshada or Paushada. Poshad or Paushad. This fact supports the idea that the difference in word forms is related to difference in sectarian affiliation. <coughs> Regarding the difference between the use of Paushada and Poshada, Clear understands cannot be seen. <clears throat> Based on William's argument, many scholars have so far regarded the word form poshada as the representative Sanskrit corresponding to the Prakrit form posa. For example, Jain in 1979, Wiley 2009, Bore 2010, etc., use this word form. To give an, another example, the Jains written by Professor Bordandas, uh, also the word form Poshada, uh, also uses the word form Poshada, if I, uh, if I remember rightly. Um, but uh, it is somewhat unnatural that a Jaini belonging to the Digambara sect would use the word form Poshada, which is not found in Digambara texts. And furthermore, Bore has collected the word Proshada seen in Digambara text Ratona Kranda Shurabakachara. Uh, to Poshada, uh, which is only seen in uh, Shubetambara text. <clears throat> However, there is no reliable basis for that emendation because the word form Poshada cannot be found in any other manuscripts and editions of Ratnakaranda Shravakachara. On the other hand, <coughs> Indian scholars seem to be using the word forms prevalent in their own sect. Uh, for example, uh, Sogani and Bargaba use Proshada and Mehta, Mohanrad Mehta, uses Paushada. <coughs> in cases of scholars without specific sectarian background, it is better to clarify the sects and texts which use that for word form. <clears throat> Section four, etymological interpretation of POSA. <clears throat> Finally, I would like to give an overview of the etymological interpretation of corresponding Sanskrit words for the Prakrit posaha seen in Shravakachara texts. One of them is as follows. The word posha means nourishment, the thing which brings date, the nourishment posha to dharma in order, that is poshada. <clears throat> the meaning of poshada brata is that poshada itself is a bow, bow, uh, brata. That means completely poshada. The above sentence is an example for William's failing to identify his sources. In addition, 
Similar examples can be seen in texts such as Dharmabind Bridge and uh, Navapada Prakarana Bridge and Shraddhadina Kritya Bridge, <coughs> which are not mentioned by Williams. These are all Shubeta Ambara texts. They divide the word Poshada or Paushada into two parts and understand Posha as meaning enhancement, nourishment, development, etc., derived from root push. And they interpret Da as being derived from root Dha. Such an interpretation cannot be found in Digambara texts using the word Prosha. As one of the few instances in which Williams draws on Digambara texts, he gives an example taken from Acharopadesha. Uh, this text is difficult to obtain, so I could not uh, reference. <coughs> but a similar example is also found in Lati Sanhita. <coughs> the bowl, which is called Proshada, is the best medicine, Paramaushada, skilled in destroying birth, death. The word form, poshada, seen in Shravakachar texts is found not only in Jain texts, but also in Buddhist texts. In particular, it is seen in Buddhist tales such as Divyabhadana, Mahabhast, etc which are written in Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. <clears throat> but no etymological interpretation is provided in these texts. <clears throat> uh, but from the Chinese translation of the other texts, it can be seen that the translator considered the word to be derived from root push, as in the case of giant texts. <coughs> the Shravakachara texts also contain an etymological interpretation of the word Upabasa, derived from the same root as Posa. These texts also provide an etymological interpretation which keeps the content of the giant bowl in mind. On the other hand, in Brahmanical texts, we can find an etymological interpretation which is conscious of the purification rites performed before Vedic rituals. These comparisons are an interesting topic in itself, <coughs> but due to space constrictions will be omitted in this presentation. I intend to examine this subject on a future occasion. <coughs> Section five, <coughs> conclusion. In conclusion, the main points of this presentation can be summarized as follows. Williams states that there are several Sanskrit word forms like paushada, proshada, poshada, corresponding to the Prakrit posa. In addition to that, 
the only exceptional form, Uposhada is found in editions currently in circulation. However, it is necessary to carefully consider whether this, fo this form can be traced back to the original manuscript. Many scholars have followed William's opinion that <coughs> Poshada has attained the most general currency. <coughs> but we cannot accept this statement unqualifiedly. For example, as I argued in this presentation, the word form Poshada is actually the most common. However, an important factor in this regard is the fact that Digambara overwhelmingly has more Shuraba cultural texts than Shubetambara. <coughs> With regard to these three word forms, Proshada, Paushada, Poshada, a difference in usage in accordance with sectarian affiliation can be clearly discerned. That is, Digambara uses Proshada, the word form Proshada, while Shubetambara uses Paushada or Poshada. <coughs> the etymological interpretation of the word forms Paushada and Poshada used by Shubetambara sect is often employed because it is easy to assume root push as their word origin. In addition, the word form Poshada is also found in Buddhist texts. <coughs> and the fact that Chinese translators of Buddhist texts too assumed the root push to be behind that word made it easy to reach this conclusion. <coughs> and the etymological interpretation that Upabasa derived from Upabas, just like in the case of Posaha, is also commonly found in Shurabaka Chara texts. Although I only touched on this point briefly in this presentation, interesting differences can be seen between the etymological interpretation found in Shurabaka Chara texts and Vedic texts. I would like to discuss this point in the future. Um, that's, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Th thank you very much indeed. You've definitely advanced our understanding of this term. Uh, the nuance between Shwetambara and Digambara usage was not known to me, and I'm really very grateful to be told this. We have a photograph, uh, a group photograph taking place fairly soon. Peter, have we got time for questions or would you feel we ought to go and look after the photographer? I know you've got a question, you always do. <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm, what do you think? Maybe time for a couple of questions. At all? Oh, well, is, is it a question or an observation? Or? Right, it's un unrelated. Well, well, uh, Ampana, why not?
We, de we definitely want you to be happy, Humpana. So, um, anybody else? Otherwise, I think we should uh, break for photograph and lunch. So, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. Peter Pruger asked me to conduct the third session of this workshop. Here we have uh, three speakers. First, uh, Dr. Yumi Fujimoto from uh, Sendai. Uh, she started her studies in uh, Sendai, Japan, and uh, continues it in in Pune, India, and uh, she got the PhD, PhD there. So today, she will talk about uh, uh, Basti in Vyabhara Bhasha 1 and 2 in comparison to Buddhist text. About the, about the Vasati in Vyabhara Bhashya, first and the second chapter, in comparison to Buddhist text. In this presentation, I would like to discuss the characteristics of Vasati with some relevant words based on Vyabhara Bhashya, first and second chapter, and the Maraya Giri's commentary. In the last part in discussion, I will, rehears, I will make a small comparison to Buddhist text. I have been reading this text with some Japanese scholars here, there, and some others in Japan. And we completed first Pitika and first, first chapter and the second chapter. So I will, quote, I will quote from these two chapters. First, Basati. 1.1, 1 .1, the definition of Basati in Vyabhara Bhashya and the Maria Giri's commentary. According to the following gathers, Basati is a place where sadhus, monks stay, and synonymous with shaya. Basahi ni basae yatta. In the commentary, tata sadhu jana itaro ba yatara ni basati sa basati. Or 959, shaya basati, a shaya is a basati. Then let's see other examples of basati one by one. 1.2. The rules on storing implements for those who undertake Egala Vihara Pratima. According to the following gathers, monks who will undertake Egala Vihara Pratima are not allowed to store their implements in their dwelling place. Atomiya Basati in the Maragri's commentary. Acharyas are allowed to do so, probably in their dwelling place. Atomiya Basati, although the storage site is not mentioned. Well, uh, gan, mm, 7,976 
I, I have difficulty translating this sentence into English. Uh, not all the monks should be absent from their tasati. According to Gata 996, three monks are the minimum number of monks to go for Bihara roamings. If two monks are roaming, sometimes they have to go separate ways and possibly commit faults. However, if they do everything together, they, so they sometimes have to be absent from the Basati where they are staying, and there can be faults too. Therefore, not all mo the monks should be absent from their dwelling place while they are staying there. Uh, 997, in the commentary, Tadu yata eko basati para ha, eko bikshara tam gata ha. Basati para siya hinda mana do basati ruga fudo sha babati. Page three. If two monks are ro roaming and if they go out of basati, there can be four listed in 998. Mitcha tabade ya charana, bade ya marana, tirikka manayana. Ae sabara nikke ya ne ya sunne babe dosa. Because there can be these holes, Bihara should not be undertaken by two monks, or not all the monks should be absent from basati. In these doshas listed in 998, the first two uh, words are illustrated in detail with some, with some occurrences of Basati, so I quote it here. Uh, please read if you like. And 1.4, regarding the facilities. There are a few gathers which are helpful to know the facilities of Basati. The following gathers show the situation where monks are going out arresting home upashuraya or basati to wash a bowl or to go for begging arms. This indicates that basati does not include a place to wash. In addition, a place to boil stools does not seem to be in a, does not seem to be included in basati. Here I collected examples in which a monk goes out of basati or upashuraya to go for begging arms or to wash a bowl. Please move down to 1.5. The following letters are quoted from the Bashiya on the Vyabahara Sutra 2.7, second chapter, Sutra number seven. If a monk who is undergoing Parihara becomes sick, he should not be expelled, but should be given a place to stay in Pasati. As long as the Pasati is far free from faults, This is mentioned in Gata uh, 1035, in the commentary. Here I quoted uh, If a monk undergoing Parihara becomes alone with some reasons, he comes to another gacha and join it. Among these reasons, for the case in which a monk undergoing parihara is captured by Ashiba, something is auspicious. Rules are provided in more detail. They are 1041 onwards. When either a gacha or a monk who is undergoing parihara is captured by something inauspicious, the monk undergoing parihara is not allowed to join the, join the gacha because it can be Another pointless for the other. If both are captured by a Sadorisha Ashiba, he is allowed to join the gacha and give a place to stay in, in a basati. If the Sayata of the basati feels dissatisfied and Pashira is arranged for him either outside the village or far from the dwelling place. So let's see this in Maraya Giri's commentary on 1042. This is repeated again in the comment in Gata 1044. I think I should have quoted more. After, after begging the Upashiraya, the monk undergoing Parihara is sent there, and another monk attends him. And if monks make the householder, 
very displeased. At the Sagaricas ya garden, a pretty caranam, Tata Hasarbe, Pianya to Rabasa Timiach to Baba Distante. Please move down to one point six Shayatala. A Shayata is a person who has given a lodging to a monk or a nun. Monks and nuns are not allowed to accept food given by the Shayatala. The following gathas are quoted partly from an explanation of Satta, Parishubasta, and Ahat Chanda, Yatat Chanda. According to 847, uh, Parishubasta is Shayatara Pinda. And uh, Yatat uh, Chanda, selfish monk says thus, Shayatara Pinde, Grihiyama, ne, nasty dosha. Or, ya di upakara nan ke na pi na furiya te tata ha shun yam basata u kuriyama na kuriyama na yam dokko do shaha. Number two about upashuraya. Upashuraya, upasaya is defined as monastery in some preceding studies. However, as in the god as quoted below, sometimes upashuraya does not seem to be a monastery, but it conjures an image of a small temporary shelter or a resting place. Although it is difficult to explain the difference between Upasaya and Basati, it, I, I think it's certain that Upasaya cannot be replaced with Basati in the following gathas. Basati will be a term which covers a wider concept. Yeah. We have seen some examples of Upasaya earlier in the example of Basati. In addition to them, I quoted some gathas here. The Malaya Giri's commentary, which follows Gata 184, here, this commentary is about Brihat Kalpa Sutra, Udeshaka First Sutra number six, and this example may be different. I translated here in a resting home, but resting home or a monastery both are possible, I think. But in but 771 and others, Upashira seemed to be a small tent. Temporary shelter or resting place. 771, Padama Upas Sayam Mi Bi Yaba Hin. As for Satva Bhavana, the first one is performed in a resting home, the second one is performed outside the resting home. 900. Please, please come to page 9. The Marayagi's commentary. Upashira ya se ya anta hamado ye, linga se ya chatta na pratiya ga hakriyate. Yadi ba ba hiru upashira ya to, ata ba grama hamado ye, yadi ba grama se ya parishi be asan ne pradeshe, ata ba ata torai ba chari ya samipe. Or, one thousand seventy eight in the Marayagiri's commentary. Yata atora eta sumi upashira ye asma kan rakshatan api esha esha pisha chaha gratira ha kadachi to spi. Pitati, Apagachati, Sa Parikusta Buyaha, Pari Rakusta Buyaha. About other examples, see one point five. Number three, Abishaya and Nabi Naishediki. Based on Marayagri's commentary, the following are suggested as characteristics of Abishaya and Naishediki. First, both are secondary to a basati and placed separately from a basati, either inside or outside the fence of a basati, eka buriti parikshepa. Monks are allowed to go there with permission when there is a reason. Archers are not allowed to go there with some except exceptions. Sometimes they are far from a basati. However, a basiaka should be performed in the basati. We, uh, let's, let's check one by one. First outline, they are, they are the places which monks are allowed to go in a group, host body, etc. with permission. The difference between Abishaya and Manishetik depends on whether monks spend a the night there or not. If monks return a basati at night, the place is called Abishetik. And if they spend the night there, the place is called Abishaya. Under the situation where there are several places to stay, uh, Lodging which is primarily used is a basati, and others such as Abishaya and Abinai Shediki are secondary to the basati. Then I'd like to think of the 
architectural form of them. Not many passages are available regarding this. Based on 672 and 73, I'd, I'd like to suggest two points. Abishai and Nabishai can be located either inside or outside a uh, fence of a basati. Abishai shares the same Prishta Bansha with the basati, or it has its own Prishta Bansha. Uh, Nabishai always has Prishta Bansha individually. Page 11, please come to page 11. Uh, number two, the reasons to go to Abishaya and Abinai Shediki. Because there can be false, monks are not allowed to go to Abishaya and Abinai Shediki without reason. The appropriate reasons are given in 638. I quoted in footnote and I summarized as below. The reasons to go to Abishaya and Abinai Shediki. Subadiyaya cannot be performed in a basati or secret teachings are given. The reasons to go Abishaya, when there is no enough space for all monks to lie down to sleep even shift in the basati <coughs> or Sansatte, uh, Sansatte pra, pra, Pranajati Virupa Shuraye. I, I have difficulty in translating this. Uh, the, and the, the last one, there is a leak in a dwelling place. Number three, rules regarding Abishaya and Abinai Shediki for Acharyas. According to the following authors, an Acharya is not allowed to go Abishaya and Abinai Shediki. The reasons for this prohibition are also explained there. For example, women may seduce him, Shaya Tara may feel displeased, or opponents in debate may catch and ruin him. However, there is an apabada. If he is not recognized as an Acharya, if there can be no fault because of people of good nature, an Acharya is allowed to go there. I think this exception seems to be applicable only in the situation where Abishaya or Abinai Shediki is outside of the hands of Abasati. Please come to page 12. The third line, besides Acharya, Gata 642 lists some other monks who are not allowed to go there. A Pratcharin of an Acharya is not allowed to go there when he has something to do for Acharya. Not all monks should go there for the risk of thieves. A Baraban, strong, strong monk, can protect his Acharya and therefore is not allowed to go there, and some others. In other words, any monks other than the monks mentioned here will be allowed to go Abishaya and, and Abinai Shediki. Number four, regarding, the, regarding a situation where Abishaya is far from Abasati, Gata 688 provide, provides a rule for following three cases. First, Subadiyaya cannot be performed in Abasati and the Guru has gone to a place to avoid stools, etc. Number two, uh, a monk sees many guest monk coming while he is going to a place to avoid stools. Number three, a monk hears that no Subadiyaya is performed in the Basati while he is going to place to avoid stools. In any of these three cases, under conditions that there is no time to take permission with that, because the Abishaya where he is going to is far from the Basati, he is allowed to go there without permission. In Gata six, in the commentary on six, Gata six hundred thirty-three, the Abishaya also seem to be distant from Abasati. Tatora tora mura pasatim agachatam stena suba pada bir atma birada na ata na ayan na ayan ti pasatim tada abishaya sami pe aprati pe kusta sta na shurayana taha sanya birada na. Gata six hundred seventy four. Onwards, and the Malayali's commentary explains the time to go to Abishaya with reference to Abashiyaka. Monks go to an Abishaya after performing Abashiyaka in their dwelling place, and the next morning they return to the Basati and perform Abashiyaka in the Basati. Number four, Kshetra. Kshetra has several meanings, landed property, field, place, region, etc. In the following letters, the Malayali's commentary Kshetra is used in the sense, in the general sense, a place or a region such as village, such as a village or a town, city. However, in some passages, Kshetra is used in the sense of the 
in the sense of a site or a territory of Ghana gacha. 4.1 Kshetra, a place of region such as town, village, or city. Kete Gama di, or in the commentary, Kshetra, Nama, Grama, Nagara, this. Let's see next example, 243. Arasa, a lazy monk, should not be admitted if he comes for admission. He is illustrated in Gatas 253 and the commentary as below. He is a monk who complains that he had, no, he had to walk a long distance to collect arms as the Kshetra, where he stayed was Kshuraka or Karukasha. In this Gata and commentary, Kshetra is used in the sense of a village or a town, city. Then please, please come to 4.2, Kshetra in the sense of a site or a territory of Ghana. According to the following gathers, a monk who is undergoing Paranchita stayed outside the Kshetra. Although the Kshetra can be interpreted as a place such as a village or a city, Kshetra in the sense of a, the site or a territory of Ghana is more plausible. First, Kshetra in the sense of the site where Ghana is established. Maria Gil's commentary on 1793. <laughs> 57 in the commentary. Abaroka in the sense of a territory of Ghana. Sagano ya padutto se aban no tan cha karana natti, ee hin karane hin agihibu te batta batna. Please, please see Maria Gil's commentary in the second line. Ketta sabah hin kau na te bi ketta sabah hin tia, ma te sin abakka na itta na mitcharu pa itcha safara ho unti, agihibu yan ke ya be na upatta benti. Here, Kshetra seems to be used in the sense of a terri territory of uh, Ghana. Number five, discussion. The characteristics of Basati are discussed here with reference to the relevant words focused earlier. A comparison to the Buddhist text is also made here to reveal the characteristics. The word Upashirea in the Vyabahara Bhashya, first and the second chapter, and the Marayagri's commentary is used mainly in the sense of a temporary shelter resting or retiring place. When compared with Upashira, Basati will be a term which covers a wider concept. Upashira is sometimes used as a place where a single monk stays, while Basati is used as a place where a group of monks stay. Abhishayana and Naishiki are the secondary places for monks to spend a night or to perform Subadhyaya, which are used when they have difficulty doing so in the Basati where they stay. On the other hand, Basati is the primary place for them as well as the place where their Acharya stays. Those who go to Abhishaya should perform Abhishaya in the Basati before departing and after returning from there. According to a definition, Abhishaya and Aminai Shediki can be either inside or outside the fence of Basati. Kshetra can be interpreted as either the site where Agana is established or the territory of Agana in a few passages. Basati seems to indicate the lodging or a site of lodging, where, while Kshetra indicates a territory for Kshetra further study is needed. Basati does not seem to include a place to wash, pot, wash a pot or a place to boil stools, although the distance between them is not clear. Basati does not seem to be a monastery where monks can live in seclusion. Based on the above, it can be suggested that Basati is the main lodging house for monks in a region and is the place 
is the place Acharya always stay, Basati will be similar to Avasa or Bihara in the sense of monastery in the Buddhist text. Although Basati does not seem to have as many facilities as the Bihara in the Buddhist text has, Upashiraya, Abhishaya, and Abhinayashadiki are similar to Senasana or five kinds of Lena in the Pali Vinaya, which are places to stay, but does not necessarily mean the site of, of a group of monks, Sangha. As there is a difference between Basati and other places to stay, similar, dis similar dis distinction is seen in the Pali Vinaya. For instance, Pali Vinaya Mahabhaka, second chapter, five points from three to six. The Buddha encourages Bhikkhu Mahakapina, who has stayed alone at Madakuchi Migadae, to go to a formal act of the order and go to observance. In Mahabaka, in another part, for the situation where several avasas have the same boundary, it is regretted that the observance should be carried out in the avasa where Tera stays. According to Mahabaka, second chapter, another part, monk Monks should carry out the observance, having agreed upon the observance hall, which is any of five kinds of lena. This is regretted because some monks have carried out the observance in a different room every time in their avasa. In short, when there are several places to stay in a region or in a site, one becomes the main place and the, the rest becomes the secondary. Along with the characteristics of Basati, the concept of Kshetra should be considered. In Buddhist order, all monks in a boundary are required to attend a formal act of the order and the observance. Therefore, when some monks need to perform them separately, they have to go out of the boundary in which they stay. The phrase is Nishimangan to No strict rules regarding the territory of a Ghana or a Gacha are found in the Vyabhara Bhashya, the first and the second chapter, and the commentary. However, there was a thing which suggests that the Jain monks had a similar practice. For an Acharya who has fallen into, into Paranchita falsely and come to another Ghana, monks in the Ghana went out of the territory so that they can initiate the Acharya without making him a householder. It's supposed that the Jain monks also had the concept of the territory of Ghana or Gacha, although it's not as strict as in the Buddhist text. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fujimoto. Uh, now we have time to accept two or three questions. Anyone? You have no question or suggestion, any suggestion? Uh, Do you know whether these rules apply also for the nuns of the order? This text. This text does not mention third, for third bees, and I don't know whether I, we can apply this rule to giant nuns or not. And Um, Dr. Sonis, do you understand? Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more, one more question is Peter. Uh, 
I, I don't know if monks stay in temple or not. I don't think they stay in temple, but Basat is a place to stay. So. I think it's a suggestion. Thank okay, you thank you. Uh, you. You may have, uh, other people may have a question, but uh, we don't have enough time to <laughs> discuss this matter here. So afterward, uh, privately, you, you can ask to Dr. Fujimoto. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to invite uh, the Dr. Kawasaki to our stage from uh, Tokyo, University of Tokyo. He started his study in Buddhism and Jainism in uh, Osaka University, Japan, and now he's teaching at University of Tokyo. So today, He's going to discuss uh, Hajibadra series on the property, property ownership by the Buddhist mendicant. Please. Hello, uh, I'm Yutaka Kawasaki uh, at, <coughs> at the University of Tokyo. So uh, today I prepared the handout of my presentation, but I don't know <laughs> and where it is now. <laughs> uh, I, I prepared the handout of my presentation, <coughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but now I don't know where it is. <laughs> so uh, uh, I will read only uh, the, my English, sorry. <clears throat> so today, I would like to talk to you mainly about the dispute on the property ownership by the Buddhist mendicants. It is preserved in Haribadra Yakini Putra's Dhamma Sangahani of 8th century. So one of the uh, needed qualities of, uh, for the renouncers in ancient India was to have freedom from attachment of worldly things. The Jains have treated the attachment and aramba, uh, it means uh, intentional activity or uh, violent activity or violence itself, as a couple of the most fundamental sins. And aparigraha, no attachment, has been one of the five vows of Vratas. Uh, so the word aparigraha can denote renouncing any uh, material possessions, but the Dasavayariya, one of the seniors of the Shwetambara Jain uh, scriptures, uh, that is the uh, oldest layers of the Shwetambara Jain scriptures, says, uh, so uh, Dasavayariya, uh, 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 for the uh, sixth chapter, uh, verses uh, 20 and 21, so garment, bowl, woolen cloth, or broom, the giant mendicants keep and carry such things for their restraint and the sense of shame. Nayaputta the Savior said that such a garment, etc., is not a parigraha. The great sage, that is, uh, Mahavira, said that the parigraha uh, means a murucha, uh, that that is, uh, parigraha means infatuation. So this psychological interpretation of parigraha was inherited by uh, Umasvati, uh, murucha uh, parigraha. And this definition is carried through the, as the authority uh, to the present day. On the other hand, uh, Buddhism has neither used a parigraha as a technical term, nor included the practice of uh, aparigraha into their five or 10 silas. But the Buddha Shakyamuni himself, Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, using the very word parigraha, stressed the importance of freedom from attachment. For example, the Stanipata, one of the old Pali Buddhist scriptures, 
uh, rays, uh, starting part are three ninth degrees. So now, on the other hand, I shall tell you the way of life of a householder and how acting he becomes a good disciple. For the entire bhikkhu practice cannot be carried out by one of who has possessions, that is, parigraha. Or, uh, starting part of verse uh, 815, People grieve for their uh, cherished things, for no possessions, parigraha, are permanent. Uh, seeing that this separation truly exists, one should not leave the household life. But uh, so, while Jains basically have maintained their ideal of non attachment, it has made the uh, it has made the mendicants keep the lifestyle of poverty and wandering. But the scholars have exemplified that Indian Buddhism gradually accepted the settled way of life. The Buddhist mendicants, living at the monastery, got much larger donations and accumulated various kinds of uh, properties. The Dharma Sanghani, uh, which was composed by the Shubhetava monk Haribadra Yakini Putra of 8th century, tells such a Buddhist <coughs> monastic life. And it also depicts the grounds for their possessions of properties. So, uh, Dharma Sanghani uh, 986 says that some fools, some fool, uh, some fool persons think that even the possession in the villages, etc., is faultless because it is a cause of growth of uh, three jewels, uh, Ratna Turaya. Uh, these fools are evidently the Buddhists because, uh, because the next verse says that the three jewels are Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. So against this opinion, uh, Haribadra Yakini Putra says, so, but the possession in the villages, etc., uh, is neither beneficial to, nor gives uh, pleasant results to these three jewels. You should understand that the possession in the villages, etc., is harmful, for such a possession brings forth the uh, intentional activity, that is, alamba. So the point is, Haribadra's assertion is that the possession uh, sets off the intentional activity, or alamba, uh, which inevitably uh, conduces to the violence. In other words, Haribadra's criticism is based on the ethos of nonviolence. Then, the Buddhist opponent argues back that even a mendicant who commits aramba is faultless. Uh, he says, when being free from possessiveness, uh, mama tova, rahita, one engages in the intentional activity only for the sake of the three jewels, he should be regarded as faultless, even if he is a Buddhist mendicant, that is, bhikshu. The point we should notice here is that the Buddhist opponent refers to being free from possessiveness, uh, mamatova rahita, and only for the sake of the three jewels, pratitoya uh, <clears throat> ratnatrayam, Eva. So whether or not the mendicant really possesses uh, properties does not mean much. What is uh, important is that his mind is free from possessiveness and that the uh, purpose of his possession and aramba is only for the three jewels. These two are essential to make the possessions of a mendicant and the subsequent aramba fortress. However, Haribada denies as follows. Uh, he says, so having stopped meat eating, one names meat dantikaga and enjoys meat eating because of the difference of the world. Having abandoned the intentional activity, a full person practice, uh, practices the very intentional activity uh, because of the different expression. When an act is essentially sinful, it is prohibited absolutely to do it, uh, even if one expresses it in a different uh, name which does not represent its true nature. For instance, even if one names a poison a sweet, it never becomes harmless. Or even if one names hot water a cold, it burns his skin in the world. 
So this great system reminds me of a by name of alcohol in Japan. So Japanese Buddhist mendicants and lay persons uh, often have called alcohol uh, hanyato, which means uh, hot water for wisdom. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they uh, have drunk it, uh, justifying that what we were drinking is not alcohol, but hot water for wisdom. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, alcohol never changes. Uh, never transmute into non-alcohol, even if one gives a new and different name to alcohol. After all, one who drinks hanyato, uh, hot water for wisdom, uh, transgresses the Buddhist precept which prohibits the consumption of alcohol. Similarly, even if the Buddhists give new names to their possessions and the subsequent intentional activities, they cannot avoid committing faults originating from uh, possessions and alamba. So then, the Buddhist opponent argued that the possession in the village is, is beneficial because it enables even the children to render the service uh, via Buritya Kala, via Buritya, for the Buddhist mendicants. In Haribadra's opinion, the virtuous ones should engage in service based on the irreprehensible manner. But the possession in the villages is blamable and spoils one's virtue. Having taken account the merit and the merit of oneself and others, one should engage in service. Or one may fall into the uh, vainaika, or uh, I, it is difficult to translate uh, this word, uh, so maybe the, the absolutism of uh, courtesy. So then, the Buddhist opponent insists that the Buddha does not allow the possession in the villages, but that the generous givers or dhanapati uh, voluntarily do so for the sake of their uh, roots of well-being, that is, uh, kusharamula. Haribadara's question is simple. Even so, why could both the givers and the mendicants be free from pain in the uh, next world when they commit a deed which the Buddha does not allow. The Buddhist opponent argues, uh, next, uh, next, the Buddhist opponent argues that the Buddha allows the Buddhist mendicants to receive the outcome, para, uh, from the possessions only when their mental condition is pure. While the generous givers are given approval to possess properties in the villages. So why should they suffer in pain uh, in the uh, next world? Against this uh, uh, insist, Haribadra questioned the definition of true mendicant or true bhikshu. He says that the bhikshu is called bhikshu because he is free from expectation, makes it a habit to beg arms, and uh, shuns three kinds of evil in three ways. So although no comment is given by the author himself, it is evident from uh, that the expression three kinds of evil in three ways uh, in Prakrit, tibi ham, tibi he nam, pavan, derived from the older passage like uh, in three ways, uh, that is, with mind, speech, and body. I abandon threefold action. I do not perform any evil acts, nor I cause another person to perform them, nor I allow another person uh, who performs them, of the Sabay area, chapter four, uh, chapter four. In the light of these two triplets, the Buddhist mendicants cannot be mendicants because they do allow the givers to possess properties. Therefore, Haribadra says, it is because they allow it is unreasonable that they have the state of being mendicant when the mendicants enjoy the arms which are brought to completion through the intentional activity that they are about. Then, according to the Buddhist opponent, while one who dedicates oneself to the group of Buddhist ascetic practices, that is Duhtanga, or uh, Zuda or Duhtanga, is regarded as a mendicant, as a general rule. But even if one consumes what is brought completion by the aramba or intentional activity, 
there is an exceptional case that is that he is regarded as a mendicant. According to the Buddhist opponent, if an action does not destroy the charana parinama bija, uh, which may be translated as uh, the seed, the seed for the change into the good conduct, uh, then uh, this action should be understood as an exception. The Buddhist opponent emphasizes the property ownership by the Buddhist, uh, by the Buddhist mendicants as the action which does not destroy the charana parinama bija. Based on such a thought, it is natural for them uh, that a mendicant who possesses properties is ex exceptionally uh, regarded as a true mendicant. But Haribadra denies it because this exception inevitably produces an uh, unwarranted overextension uh, in Sanskrit, uh, atiprasanga. So, uh, to, uh, atiprasanga to lay persons. Uh, what Atiprasanga here means, so the Buddhist opponent must admit that the lay person who possesses properties is exceptionally regarded as a mendicant. If even a mendicant who possesses properties is exceptionally uh, regarded as a mendicant. Because there is, no uh, there is no difference between the lay person and the mendicant in that both of them possess properties. Furthermore, Haribadra does not accept the opinion that the possession in the villages does not destroy the Charanapaninama Bija, because from the possession in the villages, uh, or, uh, from the possession in the villages, the activity originates in the villages. And from the activity, uh, a mental defilement, uh, pariculesha, chitta pariculesha, uh, inevitably arises in one mind, one's mind. And because of the mental defilement, the seed for the change into the good conduct, Charanapani Nama Bija, disappears. The Buddhist mendicants as such are not different from a king who owns villages in his fief. Thus, the Buddhist mendicants are the ones who are, uh, thus, according to the Haribadra, uh, Buddhist mendicants are the ones who are imitative of king's sport and are dropped from the way to liberation, Moksha Marga. Even when the exception is applied, it is unreasonable that the Buddhist mendicants have the quality of the true mendicants. But the Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist opponent does not agree with Haribadra because there was one case uh, which a very owner of properties uh, did not destroy the Par Charana Parinama Bija in giant history. So the Buddhist opponent says, well, when Bharata, the owner of 960 million villages, was in the pure mental state, he attained omniscience thanks to the seed for the change into the good conduct, uh, thanks to the uh, Charanaparinava Bija. Both I and you, so the Buddhist opponent and the giants, Haribadra, admit that the possession in the villages does not destroy the seed for the change in the good conduct. Why don't you realize it? So that means, so Bharata is surely the character uh, who appears in the so-called uh, universal history in Jainism. Uh, he was the eldest son of the first Tirutankara, Vishabhadeva, and was the first universal emperor, that is uh, Chakrabarti, uh, of this world era. The Svetama tradition maintains that <coughs> he attained omniscience without having renounced the household life that is to say, uh, that Bharata was the owner of 960 million villages. Uh, that is, uh, so uh, there was possession, there was a parigraha in the villages by him, never destroyed uh, the Charnapainama Bija, uh, which was a trigger of his attaining uh, Kebara Junyana or, uh, or omissions. Therefore, the giants should admit the. Uh, Therefore, the giants should admit the opinion of the Buddhist opponent if they accept their universal history as the uh, historical uh, facts. So based on the giant definition of the uh, aparigrapha mentioned in uh, area, so that is uh, murucha parigrahaha, so parigraha means infatuation, Haribadra insists on the validity of his assertion. 
he says, on that occasion, that is, uh, so uh, when Bharata uh, uh, attained omniscience, on that occasion, the seed for the change into the good conduct surely exists when Bharata's infatuation went away. And he did not act at all for that possession in the villages. But you are not, you uh, means a Buddhist opponent, <coughs> uh, but you are not gone away by the infatuation because you act such and such for the uh, position in the villages. That means, uh, so although Bharata uh, owned 960 million villages, he was, uh, he was not infatuated by the villages. Uh, in other words, mentally, he did not, he did possess nothing, that is, a parigraha. Thus, he did no aramba about the possessions in the villages, so he can, uh, he could attain the omen chance. <coughs> At first glance, uh, being free from infatuation, murucha of Jainis, and uh, being free from possessiveness, uh, mamatowa, uh, so I touched earlier, uh, uh, being free from possessiveness of Buddhism, uh, which I touched at earlier, seem to indicate the same condition. But it should be noted that there is a key difference between them. In, in Jaina thought, one who is free from infatuation, murucha, cannot commit aramba at all. Therefore, there cannot be any violence originating in him. But according to uh, Haribada Suri, Buddhism admits that even the one who is free from possessiveness may act intentionally uh, for the sake of, uh, uh, for example, uh, three jewels. Or he may cause someone to commit a ramba. Or he may allow someone to ho uh, who commits a ramba. This is why Haribadra criticizes the possession in the villages by the Buddhist mendicants who are said to be free from possessiveness. For Haribadra, being free from possessiveness of Buddhism is not the true state of the non-attachment. Then the Buddhist opponent argues that this practice of possession in the villages is faultless because it is prescribed in the Buddhist scriptures, which is the authority in this case, just like the practice such as Chaitya Bandana, uh, authorized by giant scriptures. Haribadra questions, uh, why could that be a scripture? It prescribes the uh, practice uh, which, the, uh, which, oh, sorry. <coughs> why could that be a scripture? Uh, it prescribes the practice which uh, is the seed for the impure change. This is a, a falsification of scripture. Even when only the lay people, uh, even when only the lay people keep up a vigil at the possession in the villages, the Buddhist mendicants are also sinful because they enjoy the products which are prepared especially for the mendicants. That is a giant technical term, Ada Karma. Aha Karma or Ada Karma. So finally, the Buddhist opponent says, such a mere fault is not regarded as a fault because it is the outcome of this bad error. But why can uh, one be faultless when he commits the sinful activity which can be removable? So uh, while this dispute, uh, while this dispute uh, recorded in the Dhamma Sanghahani seems to reflect some historical facts of Buddhist monasteries in the medieval period, I cannot say for certain whether or not such a dispute uh, actually happened between Haribadra giants and the Buddhists. At this point, I'm not sure uh, about the name of Buddhist sect or school, also Dharma Guptaka or Sarva Sivada, uh, etc., which Haribadra criticized. So, as a future task, whether or not Haribadra correctly tells about the Buddhist opinion must be judged. So, it is imperative to fully correct the account or found in the Hinayana or Mahayana uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist texts or inscriptions which depict the possession of properties by the Buddhist mendicants, and try to identify each passage with a relevant record of the Dharma Sangha Hani. 
So uh, despite such shortcomings of my presentation, uh, if this is of any uh, help to those concerned, I would be glad. Uh, so human beings uh, so must fight uh, the sleep, uh, sleepiness after eating a <laughs> after eating a delicious lunch. So thank you very much for uh, uh, kind of attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kawasaki. Uh, now we have uh, about 10 minutes for our di discussion. Do you have any question or suggestion? Yes. So uh, on the second question, uh, so I have no idea. So, uh, but uh, I think Mahavira and the Buddha do not think, do not think that his disciples or monks and nuns are not their so possessions. So, so, so okay, it's it's too close. But uh, sorry, I, I I can't understand the first question, <laughs> Professor Hamba. <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other question? Yes, please. Oh, do you follow? <laughs> yeah, do you follow? No, 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 thank you. So I, I, I'm sorry. Yes, of, of course. Uh, So you, you discuss this matter after, later? OK. <laughs> with, with, a, uh, with a T, OK. <laughs> so any other question? Oh, Peter. Haribadra uh, does not uh, uh, define the, Aram, the word Aramba itself. So uh, I refer to the uh, commentaries of Tathavarta Sutras uh, and or so Shubhetamba definition, Shubhetamba commentary definition. So, uh, so in the older, in the oldest meaning, so Aramba uh, means uh, so uh, violence itself. But in the course of time, the Aramba's meaning has changed. So uh, Aramba then so means uh, intentional activity. But uh, at the same time, intentional activity itself is uh, violent, violent. 
in giant, giant uh, interpretation. So, but, uh, but in this text, Hybert does not uh, define the word. Oh, Peter, do you understand? No, there is no good. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have uh, another three minutes. So, uh, yes, please. No, so uh, Haribadra uses the words so gama di padigaha, parigaha, that is so in Sanskrit, grama adi parigraha. And this is, uh, uh, this, and this compound is interpreted by the Haribadra himself uh, is, uh, as a locative tatpusha. So uh, that is a, a, a possession in the villages. Uh, that is not. Uh, Possession of the villages. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there is no uh, reference to the, uh, the temples. Okay. So, yeah, so my handout is uh, fade away. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I apologize. So uh, uh, you, you must hear the, uh, my uh, terrible uh, pronunciation of English. I'm sorry. Oh, we are prohibited to have anything. <laughs> Even the ha handout we can't have. So I think now it's a time for explosion. Thank you very much, Dr. Kawasaki. Thank you very much.